Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today with Professor Margaret Graver, a professor of classics at Dartmouth. And we are going to talk about Lucretius, the very famous yes. Lucretius. Yeah. Um, although I gather he wasn't very famous at his time, or was he? Well, we don't know a great deal about Lucretius's mm -hmm. life. We know that he had um, a fairly high standing in Roman society since he had a very fine education, clearly. We know that he um, must have had some acquaintance with Cicero, the great orator. Okay. Yep. Um, but as far as reliable biographical information about his life, there's essentially nothing. Uh. Only really we know when he wrote his poem. So uh. there's no historian that talked about him afterwards or about his life or influence? Well, there is Jerome. Jerome did mention him in a brief biographical notice among other uh, ancient figures whom he included in a kind of catalog. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what he says is not very complimentary. I can't yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, Jerome, Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome, oh, yes. Okay. Yes, he thought he was <laughs> insane and <laughs> several right. other things. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine, right. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't rely on that. Now, Cicero mentions him in a letter. Um, and that's an interesting point because it gives us a date mm, um, at okay. which the poem must have been complete. So he writes to his brother Quintus in the year 54, uh, mentioning having read Lucretius's poem and apparently admired it. Huh. So can you tell us a little bit about this, so f this poem? You know, what is it? Why do you think it's so famous? And was it famous at the time? Well, I think that it's uh, interesting to put the poem in context with the late Republic, uh, what was going on in the literary scene. Mm. So one thing that was, uh, we might call a mini vogue, right in the middle of the first century BCE, mm -hmm. was Romans um, uh, who had literary accomplishments turning major works of the Greek intellectual tradition into their own medium of Latin hexameter verse. Huh. So Cicero himself um, wrote a verse translation of an astronomical poem by Aratus. Um, mutual friend Salustius wrote a Latin translation of the great uh, philosophical poem of Empedocles, much older poem. Mm. And it was right at that same time that Lucretius took on a similar challenge with the atomistic hedonism of Epicurus, a really formidable challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, those others that I mentioned, they were already poems in Greek. Um, so turning them into Latin was challenging, but not insurmountable. Epicurus writes in a very dense, very technical prose. And Lucretius, he produces a, just, a, just a brilliant success. Um, rough, rough around the edges, but um, captures something, produces something that must have been really arresting in his own time. So do you think it was uh, almost like a popularization of Epicurus? I mean, to the intellectual elite, of course. But uh, the, well, the uh, very fact of writing it in Latin would have been popularizing for his yeah. own time. But uh -huh. also, it's an it's an, a, a, an artistic product mm -hmm. as much as it is a philosophical project. So you see, um, just just stunningly lush and beautiful poetry at some points, was admired very much by Virgil, was a great influence mm. on Virgil and Ovid. Um, at other places, struggling with this difficult language in Greek, mm. he produces a kind of somewhat uncouth Latin verse that is nonetheless, to me at least, quite beautiful in a mm -hmm. very stark way. The vision that he brings, just the, the visual imagination is, is just amazing. So most of the material that he is trying to explain is what we would call physics. Yeah. It's the movements of atoms and giving explanations for it. 
atoms, the shapes of atoms, how they create the objects that we observe in the world, void, some rather technical points about mm -hmm. how atoms move and interlock and create uh, different uh, things like light and vision, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's sometimes quite complicated. And yet he manages to somehow get that all into poetry. Yeah, in a beautiful yeah, way, yeah, right? So. I mean, it's, and what can you, if you were to describe sort of the cosmological vision of this thinking, you know, I mean, what kind of universe he believed he lived in, could you do that? Well, um, so you must realize that in the mind of Epicurus, whom Lucretius was trying to convey, mm -hmm. um, and in Luc Lucretius' own mind, there are only two things that exist. That is atoms and void. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you cannot see either of them. <laughs> um, only the properties that atoms in fact have, their mass, as we would say it, yeah. um, and um, shape. Mm -hmm. Out of those properties, uh, arise all of the properties that we observe. So there are no colored atoms, there are no soft atoms. Atoms are impenetrable, uh, cannot be split or, or mm -hmm. changed in any way. They, are, they exist from the beginning of time. Mm, interesting. Although mm. the world that we observe does not exist from the beginning of time. Uh -huh. it, uh, that's, it is one of many cosmoi that comes into existence at a particular point and then again will eventually decay. So they were right on. That is our modern that cosmological sense, view in too. In that sense, yes. The poem feels very modern to us Yeah. Uh, when we read it. Um, Greenblatt talking about it, uh, described it as containing Einstein, Freud, <laughs> Darwin, and Marx. Wow, it's all, all there. Four. Yes, right. yes. Einstein presumably because of the scientific commitments. I mean, you start with very basic scientific principles like nothing comes from nothing, nothing mm -hmm. dissolves into nothing, um, and down to technical points like the minimal part of an atom. So although an atom is unsplittable, nonetheless it must still have, for instance, corners if it has shape. Yeah, it has some identity. Yes, so right. that we can actually isolate mentally, although of course not observationally, mm -hmm. um, the very tiniest parts of the atom, but at some point there is no infinite divisibility of the atom. Right. Um, so you have actually minima that make up the atom uh, unsplittably. So but it's also sort of like a basic building block yes. of material. Yes. But not just yes. material, sensorial reality too, yes. right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, interesting. Okay. Um, <coughs> but the thing that I think is so arresting for us is, yes, it is the, what we think of as a scientific approach and then it's atomism, but there's a scientific approach in a, in a deeper sense, or um, it's sometimes been called modernism in mm. a deeper sense, in that this is a cosmos that has no divine intervention it has no divine plan. It's an anti-teleological -te uh, cosmos. Very so, much so, um, yeah, yeah. So things are not tending for the best. Things simply are what they are. So explain to people yeah. what teleology means. So in many uh, ancient systems, we have um, Aristotle, for instance, the Stoics, also Plato in a different way, mm -hmm. hold that there is a designer. Yeah. Um, so there is what is now sometimes referred to as intelligent design. Some, um, some being is producing the world that we observe in order for it to be good, for mm -hmm. it to serve some purpose. So teleolo teleology simply refers to purpose. Yeah. Um, but in Epicurus's mind, there is no purpose mm -hmm. for what we observe. Mm -hmm. There are simply interactions of atoms and void. No wonder Jer yeah. Saint Jerome didn't like that. I know, he did yeah. not like that very <laughs> much at all. Yeah. Curiously though, Epicurus is not an atheist. Uh, and Lucretius right. himself is not an atheist. 
Um, he does hold that there are deities, but they are not involved with the world in any way. They're sort so of detached our, observers, or not even observers. They couldn't care less, sort of, or do they care? Well, the claim is that if we really think about what we mean by a divinity, mm. that would be above anything that we might do or anything that might right. take place in the world. So it's, it, to think that a, a god could be angered or pleased mm -hmm. by any human action is inconsistent with the very notion of what blessedness must entail. So yes, there are gods, but they're out there. They're models for us Good. in some sense. In terms of the existence that we have, the world that we live in, we are alone. Mm -hmm. And this does feel, <clears throat> this does feel very much like the universe that yes. many of us find ourselves in at least four days a week. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. That that's so much yes, true. Yes. And um, so, we, he does talk about superstition, right? In one oh of yes. His, in his, oh uh, yes. So how does he deal with that? Because that, he's talking about the old god superstition, right? Not this one that you just mentioned. So the real problem is fear. Fear. So fear of the divinity and of the entire belief system that goes with a notion of an involved deity is one of the um, drivers of our human psyche. So I mentioned Freud, you mm -hmm. see. Uh, even those who are not conscious of being afraid mm -hmm. of a deity, um, nonetheless may harbor some deep-seated doubts, some deep-seated su uh, superstitions right. that will drive them to behave in certain ways, especially when the chips are down. Yeah, um, So Lucretius talks about that person who claims not to believe uh, in any deity, but when they're driven into exile, when family members die, they suddenly begin to pray. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we see that what they thought they believed was not in fact what they believed. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the two great fears that drives uh, human life. The other one being the fear of death. Right. So we, um, a great deal of the poem is spent explaining in vast detail why you must not believe that the soul is immortal. Mm -hmm. Very bad thing for you to believe. Uh, and very, very illogical. If you think about what kind of thing the human spirit has to be, which would be what? <laughs> atoms. Right. Yes, it would the be made of stuff atoms. Like, That's yes. the only thing it could be made of. Yeah. Um, so some configuration of very, very fine light atoms that is centralized, and he thinks actually in the chest rather than in the mm. brain, but also distributed through the limbs, so kind of nervous system mm -hmm. that couldn't exist outside of your body. Right. So it, it must, uh, uh, death is in fact the end for you. Mm -hmm. And then explaining to you in great, uh, with great power and passion and uh, imagery, why that um, makes it completely illogical for you to think that your death would be a bad thing for mm. you, so that therefore you must not fear death. And once you realize that and really internalize that, that you will then gain a kind of peace, a kind of tranquility, and this is in fact the objective. Wow. Um, so you don't need religion to no. stop fearing death. No, no. And in fact, yeah, a religion can produce many evils. Yeah, us. exactly. Yeah. yeah, people always ask me, if you don't believe in God, you know, how can you sleep at night? I'm like, very well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps better than you. you know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's wonderful. And, um, and of course, to us, it's very interesting also what happens after his time, meaning, you know, so his poems almost disappeared, right? I mean, that's right. As long disappeared as you disappeared for about it, a thousand years. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then they were discovered. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? How much of it we know is right and how much was embellished? And well, it's, it's gained quite a bit of attention in recent years because of Stephen Greenblatt's book, The Swerve. Um, so uh, Greenblatt was, in fact, uh, himself a Shakespearean scholar, yeah. but read Famous this poem one. of Lucretius and was completely gripped by it, just taken mm -hmm. over by it. Yeah. Um, and uh, made the decision to tell a kind of cultural history of the Renaissance 
centered on the discovery, rediscovery of Lucretius's poem by Cardinal Poggio, which was in 1417. Okay. Um, uh, the claim being that that moment was, he calls it the swerve, by is which that a he, it's only in a metaphor is for that him uh, this yeah, at that point. Right, uh, right. Uh, there is, of course, the famous doctrine of the swerve in the poem. We'll get to that in a minute. But, um, but this event at which Poggio discovers the poem is a kind of fresh wind that is blowing in a European culture that would seem in many ways to be very hostile to the world that is in Lucretius's mm. poem, um, and sets uh, in motion many, many different ways of thinking that uh, uh, in some ways pave the way for the modern era. Yeah, you know? because as far as I know, and of course mm -hmm. I'm no expert, but no one was thinking this way at that time. Or at least, not, I mean, you could talk a little bit about you know, some people in Oxford and some of their ideas, but very few people would say things like there's atoms in the void. In the 15th no, century? Yeah, no, so there's no, no divine so. intervention in the world. I mean, these are like amazing ideas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it must have impressed some people very deeply, just like mm -hmm. they impress us very deeply now when you look at this. I think that for many people, the sheer beauty of the poem and the fact that it was written in a, um, a Latin poetry that is very similar to the poetry of Virgil mm. must have been what gave it a lot of the influence okay. that it had. Yeah. Um, uh, but ultimately, it isn't as a poem that it gained its influence. It's as a vehicle of powerful yeah. ideas. It's a manifesto, yes. I think. A kind of manifesto. Yeah. Um, so that when uh, students read the poem now, they it's an interesting reaction hmm. that I get from students. Because at first, it's, you know, it's, it's amazed, amazement. Oh, they knew about atoms back then. Uh, right. And uh, they're very impressed with the rigor of the argumentation because mm -hmm. it is, it it is, is a very rigorous. impressive. Yes. Um, you realize, of course, that in the ancient world, all science is armchair science. Mm -hmm. So you, you take tight reasoning combined with simple observations of the phenomena of the world and you put them together and you say, if this were not the case, then we would not observe this. Right, yeah? right. If things could come from nothing, then we would observe peaches on apple trees. Mm -hmm. But we don't observe peaches on apple trees, therefore nothing can come from nothing. Which is a wonderful uh, argument about the first <laughs> cause, which is yes, a problem absolutely. that still trumps everybody. Yeah. I mean, everybody's thinking about the first cause, mm -hmm. and we in cosmology, in cosmology, we're still completely confused about that, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think humans yeah. can figure that out, but that's so, so doing that, yeah. You know, it's sort of by decree. I mean, he's not really going very deep into it, but he's saying, look, just nothing can come out of nothing, so give it up. You know, the creation ex nihilo, right, mm -hmm. uh, is an impossibility. But then some other things in the poem, uh, as my students come deeper into the text, mm -hmm. then they become sometimes a little taken aback by mm -hmm. some of the things that Lucretius attempts to explain scientifically that are perhaps not so easy to explain. Mm -hmm. So uh, an atomistic explanation for sense perception, <laughs> for vision, it's impressive that he wants to explain not only vision but even some very complex visual phenomena like yeah. optical illusions and <laughs> mirrors and that kind of thing. But then he goes yeah. on to talk about thought processes, dreams, uh. imagination, uh, volition, things that it's really not obvious that it would be possible to explain right. with atoms. But that's his option. Yeah. So sometimes the explanations feel a little forced. The contrary. Nonetheless, they're yeah. impressive. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a theory of everything. Yes. This is a yes. theory of everything. There are quite a Human few history, yeah. the <laughs> generation of animals. <clears throat> There's a, a theory of the evolution of species that is um, <laughs> impressively proto-Darwinist, I think uh -huh. it would be fair to say. Yeah. Not quite Darwin. Right. There are adaptations, for instance, he doesn't understand at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the evolution of human societies. Mm 
Um, in the fifth book, there's a, a really fascinating account where it uh, certainly looks like he's speaking about cavemen and um, uh, first societies dealing with wild animals, coming together to protect themselves, the social contract, uh, a Maybe kind of contractarian yeah. theory of justice. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, just think of that's something why like Marx this. is mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. How how many how many people nowadays could come up could construct such a thing? You know, we sort of compartmentalize mm -hmm. knowledge in such mm -hmm. a way that that's just not feasible anymore. You cannot have this sort of theory of everything. You know, and and being so powerful and transformative. I mean, it was yeah. very mm -hmm. influential at its time. So it's. It's kind of an amazing thing. Now, did uh, he do anything else? Do we know of anything else that he has done? Or is this That it? Lucretius wrote. Yeah. No, no, everything is this contained is within. Wow. Uh, do we even know if he life? had, if he did write other things, or, or this was his only work? I think this was his monumental work. Wow. So we have you okay. know, six uh, chapters, six books within mm -hmm. the poem. Mm -hmm. um, each one has its own identity. But it is clearly all one poem. Yeah. We also think that per perhaps the poem is not quite finished. So Interesting. the very last thing that you see in the poem that we have is a really devastating account of the plague that took place in Athens during the Peloponnesian War. Huh. So in a poem that begins with a kind of hymn and prayer to Venus yes, as a right. kind of emblem yes. or image yes. of generative uh, feminine sexual power that, that is both love and pleasure and that produces all the young, beautiful things in the universe. Then to go after so many amazing and challenging explanations right down into this terribly, terribly depressing mm -hmm. account of the plague. And in fact, the poem then breaks off at the very end with this, the bleakest picture you can imagine of mm -hmm. people whose relatives have died fighting one another over space on the bonfires to burn their, their diseased loved ones. It's, wow. it's just horrendous. And yeah. so it seems <clears throat> Almost illogical that Lucretius would have just left it there. Many of us would like to see a couple more pages. At a little the more end, happy uh, ending. A little well, more of a happy just, ending. But, you know. And, and it, it is indeed possible that the last couple of pages were lost in transmission. Mm -hmm. Paggio didn't find it all. It's uh, possible, yeah. Uh, it's, it's possible, but nonetheless, it makes a very impressive conclusion to the poem and must be a something that Lucretius intended. And is in line with this dynamic of creation and destruction that goes cosmically, yes, yes, but yes. it also happens. As the world had a beginning, right. it also has an ending. And right. we have to accept both. Yeah, right. so it's sort of sobering yeah. in that sense, <laughs> but, but very meaningful too. Okay, well, um, I think that was just excellent. You know, is there anything else you think would be important for us in terms of um, how he's perceived nowadays academically? Well, I thought that um, I was a little surprised you didn't ask me about the famous swerve of atoms. Oh, I, yeah, that's right. We do talk about it. But, but yeah, why don't you mention this? That's a very important point. So tell me about the swerve, because without the swerve, nothing happens, right? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. So we hear about um, uh, Epicurus's position on the freedom of the will. We hear that this is in a very important topic in the history of philosophy and very often that is mentioned as a discovery or at least a, a major theme mm. of Epicurus, Lucretius's poem is where we know about that mm. Epicurean theory. It is the major text for that. Um, the claim, interestingly, is not that free will exists. Rather, free will solves a problem for Lucretius and for Epicurus before him. So we have atoms with only these two properties. We have one law of movement. They move downward in straight lines through the void. And Epicurus faced this question, how then can atoms ever come to interact? Mm -hmm. So what he needs to be able to say is that they don't move at perfectly straight lines through the void but that every now and then 
one of them deviates just a little bit from that straight course. And he doesn't want to disrupt what he has said about them having only these two very basic properties. Mm -hmm. So he says, without cause, mm -hmm. at no particular time, no particular place, they just do. They swerve. And how do we know that this theory is correct? Well, says he, if they didn't, then we would not have free will. And clearly we do have free will, self-evidently. Huh. We have free will. Therefore, the atoms must swerve, and hence we have a world. Wow. Many, of, <laughs> many people now would have wanted to put that argument the other way around. Yeah. But that's how, that's how Epicurus puts it. And that sounds so much like the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. You know, because in mm -hmm. the uncertainty principle, you have basically, there's no such thing as a straight line anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything jiggles a little mm -hmm. bit. There's mm -hmm. always a little bit of a mm -hmm. waviness to things. And so there is no such thing as a perfectly straight trajectory. Mm -hmm. There is always going to be a small deviation from that. And that is so fundamental mm -hmm. to everything that exists. <laughs> of course, it does create some problems. Um, yeah. uh, there's uh, many people would want to challenge this uh, connection that apparently Lucretius is drawing between some kind of uncaused event at the atomic level, or for us, subatomic level. Mm -hmm and something that goes on I in know, our minds. How exactly <laughs> does that work? There is right. a jump there. Yeah. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the assertion that these two things are incompatible, that is, um, that free will is not compatible with a universe in which all events have causes. Mm -hmm. Lucretius makes that very, very clear that that is the assumption from which Epicurus is working. Many philosophers, myself included, would like to challenge that assumption so that they would be taking a position of compatibility hmm. between free will and determinism. But not Lucretius. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. I mean, if, if you have perfect mechanistic determinism, mm -hmm. then it's very hard, from a physics perspective anyway, to think about free will. You know, it's, uh, if it's sort of like... <laughs> I don't only, find it so hard. But yeah, the, uh, way, uh, the way we'll out. There. No, no, it's yeah. good to talk about this because then, uh, because uh, this connects with other parts of the course yes. too, because perhaps the way out is to say that even if there is deep down, you know, the fundamental layers of reality, mm -hmm. some level of mechanistic determinism, the fact that we can never access those, that these things are mysterious to us and we don't know what's going on deep down, we only have mm -hmm. a limited amount of knowledge about the world, so to speak, then our ignorance is our bliss, in a sense, because not knowing means we still think we're making, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's one way of thinking of reconciling these two things, if you believe mm -hmm. in perfect So that it's an, only an illusion It's an illusion, will. yeah. There are mm -hmm. other ways to do it. Um, so I guess what I would throw out for you and for your students to think about is that um, to ask what it is that we, in fact, mean and what we're looking for when we look for a concept of free will. Mm -hmm. That is, I, am, I would challenge the assumption that what we want is for our actions to be uncaused, mm -hmm. but rather that we want ourselves to be the cause yeah, of our autonomy. actions. So right. that one could, in fact, if, if it were some kind of Heisenberg thing or mm -hmm. swerve of atoms that took place at some deep level that made you get up and go mm -hmm. for ice cream, mm -hmm. that would not feel like free will right. to us. Right. I'm a, I agree yeah. with that, actually. Yeah. So then yeah. um, that the cause is internal is very different from saying that there is no cause whatsoever. Right. Yeah. No. And also... You know, when we talk about free will, mm -hmm. there are so many levels of decisions that are being made. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the people that make these experiments in the laboratory and say that there is some sort of autonomy in the brain before oh, yes. awareness, mm -hmm. and they say that's undermining free will, I think that's really nonsense. You know, I think um, it's much more complicated than that. And, and most of the meaningful decisions that we make in life are extremely complex, many level and time consuming, Yes. you know, like, oh, should I major in philosophy or should I major in biology? Mm -hmm. That could be something that will take months to decide. 
And eventually exactly. you make a choice. And you know why you made the choice. Yeah. So you were able to name the causes <laughs> yeah, and the reasons yeah, yeah. for many of the things. But that you feel you like do. you're yes. in control, right? Yeah. That's the thing. So it's quite interesting mm. that Lucretius, despite the famous passage about the swerve of atoms and the free will, mm -hmm. there is a passage later on in the fourth book where he gives his own admittedly rather clumsy atomistic account of volition. Mm. And here he says that oh, we wouldn't be able to want something if we did not already have a notion of what it is that we might, what action we might pursue. Okay. So then how would that combine exactly with a swerve of atoms that occurs at no particular place or time? Mm. Since what I need is first to see it and then for something to happen at a particular place, that is in my mind. Um, so see. it looks like perhaps even in Lucretius's text there is a little bit of a tension. Right. Nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. the way that the problem is laid out has been really important for people trying to think through some of these difficult issues. Yeah, mm. and it, you know, you know, this whole jump from the atom to the mind. <laughs> it's it's. I mean, it, it, the hard problem of consciousness, mm -hmm. right? That you mm -hmm. have in philosophy. It's a big issue too, oh, yes. right? I mean, oh yes, and we have no clue how to deal with that yet. And that's something we discuss a lot in the course too. Is basically the notion of how can the mind create the sense of subjective, you know, awareness? And and boy, would that be a mm -hmm. challenge to explain this way, yes. right? <laughs> there are other kinds of physics and of science yeah. and of things we don't even know yet that that take place there. Yes. So mystery is all over the place still. Right. That's wonderful. Yes. Well, look, thank you so much for oh, doing this. Oh, this is a pleasure to do. No, it was yes, a lot of fun. It's great yes. fun. And your course must be very interesting. Yeah, it talks about all these yeah. things, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Margaret.